Panaloids Podcast. Panaloids Podcast. Kyle and Jeremiah with our special guest, the Hound of Horror, and who'll soon be coming door to door, Mr. Cullen Bunn. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for taking the time. Thank oh. you for taking the time. Appreciate you responding on TikTok. It's a fun world on there. Yeah, we'll see. You know, I'm two and a half weeks in on TikTok and probably about 20 years too old. But, you know, I'll give it a shot. I think we're 20 years too old, so don't you worry. But yeah, I tried to strike quickly because I saw you were newer to TikTok. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm going to get them before the followers are overwhelming. But with that, okay. I have a question. So oh, I was no. scrolling. What did I do? What did I do? <laughs> and I came across a non-comic book related one. So I'm not really a drinker, but if I see something very fruity, especially if it's related to candy, because I do eat a lot of candy, I will try something. Starburst infused tequila. <laughs> Just a little, how do you do it? Because I'm tempted to try and make it. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So on TikTok, my wife found a recipe for Starburst margaritas. And the recipe that's going around on TikTok that she's seen and she's referred to me a couple of, they put it in a coffee maker. They put Starburst in a coffee maker and then run tequila mm. through it the way they run water and it comes out Starburst flavored. <laughs> so she wanted to do that. But the thing is, the temperature of a coffee maker will burn the alcohol right out of the tequila. You're just drinking water. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. So what we did is backtracking a little bit over the pandemic, I decided I needed a hobby. So I started doing infused alcohol, countless mason jars, and I put stickers on them to make them look like, you know, they were branded to me. And I was infusing bourbons and vodkas and tequilas with things like oranges and apples and cinnamon and blackberries and cherries and just doing different infused alcohol and when you do that you put them in a jar you sit them on a shelf for a month or so and then you can drink them so i did that during the pandemic to mixed results some were very good some were not so we decided to make starburst tequila in a similar way we bought a bag of bite-sized starburst we poured a bunch of them into a mason jar and then we just filled the jar with tequila every now and again you go by and you shake the jar up in a couple of days the Starburst had completely disintegrated into the tequila, so it tastes like Starburst. It doesn't taste like Starburst, but it is sweet. <laughs> it's super sweet, and it was super viscous. It was very thick, mm, but it, okay. you know, it was fine. It was fine. I don't think I'll do it again. It wasn't as good as, say, infusing a bourbon or tequila with a fruit or something like that. It was a fun experiment. As someone um, who never drinks, the idea <laughs> of putting alcohol through a coffee maker disturbed me to my core. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I posted about it on Facebook or something, and someone messaged her and said, that's not a good idea. You're going to burn the tequila right out of the tequila. And then you just have really weird tasting water. So we just did it a different way. do have just the regular Starburst. Just dump them in a jar, pour some tequila in it, and let it sit for a few days. And the Starburst will disintegrate and then just mix it up. Give it a shake every now and again. That is okay. <laughs> to comics now. <laughs> now that we got the important stuff out of the way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Colin, you have worked for pretty much everybody. Buddy. I can't think of a company that you haven't at least put out one title for. There are a couple of stragglers. Do you have a book out from IDW? Oh, yeah. So, like, Boom, Image, Marvel, DC, Valiant, Vault soon, if not already. I think you already have a book out from Vault. Yeah, I had another book with them earlier, too, yeah. A Blaze? I can't think I of it. I have not done a book. Is A Blaze still a thing? A Blaze is still a thing. Oh. Uh, Aftershock, you've done Aftershock, right? Lots of Aftershock stuff. Yeah, so you've pretty much put out a book with everyone. What do you feel separates each company from each other? What are the best parts about working for Marvel? What's the best parts about working for DC? And then all the independents. Now that well, you listen like 10 of them. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that you have enough time to go through it. I can just, tell you Just that give us it, one bullet point that is best <laughs> about it. Just one. You know, every company has their quirk and pros and cons with every one of those companies. Oh, for sure. And you just have to balance it. And, you know, for me, I keep a list that is sort of a checklist of how much the company pays, what kind of rights they're going to want, what kind of rights do I get to keep, what's their publishing schedule like, what their editorial processes are. And I kind of have a spreadsheet where I can go through all of those things and know exactly where those companies fall. And whenever I have a new project, I have to kind of put that spreadsheet in front of me and kind of go down the list because no company is the same. I mean, they're all very different. I mean, it's really getting into very specific things. So you have to break out that spreadsheet like every other day? This past couple of weeks, I've been talking to a few different artists about working on some new projects together. And some of them haven't done a lot right now. They're kind of new to the industry. So I have to kind of ask, what's important to you? Is getting an upfront paycheck important to you? Because some companies don't pay upfront. 
Some companies pay, but not that much. Some companies pay a good page rate up front, but they're going to take more of your media rights and they're going to take more of a control of those things. And none of those things are necessarily good or bad. It's just, I kind of have to balance it, what I want to get out of a project and where I want to go and, and what's important to me for each project. And that has changed from since I started to now. It changes all the time. It just all depends. It depends on what you want. Marvel and DC are nice to work with. I mean, they pay a decent page rate up front you don't own any of that yeah that's owned by somebody else and that's something i have to contend with and also when you're writing a story for marvel and dc editorial has more power than they do when you're working on a book that's solely mine sandbox is a lot smaller versus an open desert so like on that spreadsheet marvel and dc aren't even on there because i don't pitch creator owned material to marvel or dc they don't publish mm -hmm. so they're immediately you know man they're off the list just from the fact that that's not the kind of stuff they publish but yeah and, and i have to you know measure things like do i have a good relationship with the company do i get along with the editors responsiveness for me is such a huge element i know that some companies if i send them a submission i'm going to hear that day and other companies i may not hear for three months six months a year uh -huh. i don't have the patience for that <laughs> understandable well thank you for giving us some insight into that i appreciate that i like learning a little more inside baseball yeah getting into the nitty-gritty of it. it would be a long recording maybe another time then. well that actually kind of ties into my question which is kind of generally the preference of mainstream or independent work and you've listed a few is there anything outside of obviously the business aspect that why you would prefer independent or why you still have some small preference to mainstream well when it comes to the mainstream stuff and we're talking about stuff like you know the marvel characters the dc characters mm -hmm. which I, I haven't done a lot for marvel and dc in the last couple of years but it also goes into things like godzilla which i'm doing the godzilla and mighty morphin Power Ranger book or Bloodborne, which is based on a video game. The thing that appeals to me about those kind of comics is I feel like I'm contributing to a universe that maybe I really love. If I'm working in the Marvel Marvel universe, I grew up reading Marvel comics. So it's a thrill about working on those characters, especially if it's a character I just loved from the very beginning. And there's something fun about that. And that's really, I think, where a lot of creators run. You know, a lot of creators and would-be creators, they think of Marvel and DC because they just want to write a Spider-Man story or just want to do an X-Men story. And that's great. And if that's what you want to do, full speed ahead. You know, that's right, great. Right. The thing that I have to keep in mind though, I know you talked to Dennis Hopeless and he may have said this exact same thing because we share it all the time. You work for Marvel or DC. It's like you're a kid and you go to your friend's house and they have all the best toys. They have every toy you've ever wanted to play with and you can play with them. But at the end of the day, you got to put them back on the shelf, exactly the same condition you started with. And that's working with Marvel or DC. But those aren't your characters. And sometimes that's tough for a guy like me. I start feeling ownership of these characters i start really connecting with them i feel like i own that character i don't you know you can get let go like that from a book and sometimes you're in the middle of a book and they say hey we're just going to cancel that book and start another book you're kind of at that whim right. while on a creator own book i have the final say of what condition those characters are in when i say i i mean my collaborator and i but we have control over those characters and those decisions and we can build that world that we want to build from the ground up i don't know if the benefit or not it's weird that in comics a lot of people see if you're not doing a book with a superhero in it, you're somehow not as valid as someone who is doing a book with a superhero in it. And that's a little weird. I mean, that's just the way a lot of people see it is that, you know, you're not really doing comics unless you got some spandex in there. That can be a frustrating thing to experience. To keep on this just slightly, I'm just really curious because you have mentioned you haven't done anything for Marvel or DC in a while. Is there anything within those two properties that you would want to go back to? You had a fantastic long run on Magneto. You've basically touched pretty much every asset of the Marvel Universe. I'm really interested in your thoughts on your run on Lobo was not the Lobo that everyone loved. Right. Would you want to write that Lobo? Because like your Lobo was a fun take on the character, but it wasn't the Lobo of the 90s. No, it was not. Yeah, so that's a big question, but the answer is there's tons of them that I'd want to return to. So Magneto, I had huge plans for Magneto after X-Men Blue that, that I was never able to do. The X-Men Blue characters, I had huge plans for those characters that I was never able to do anything with. I'd go back to either of those characters in a heartbeat. Fearless Defenders, I would go back to that book in a heartbeat. Such an incredible run. You know, it was a weird book because it was not a perfect book by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a fun book. That book still, there's a lot of people that that book really meant a lot to when I was doing it. And 
I still get a lot of people, you know, come up and they thank me for the book. They really love that book. And that means something to me. But I'd go back to it. Warts and all, I'd go back to Fearless Defenders in a heartbeat. A Sinestro for DC. I had big plans for that that just never ended up panning out the way they were supposed to. And tied up in that would be Lobo. Because Lobo and Sinestro, I was really connecting those two characters there towards the end of both of those. And Lobo, yeah, I would probably return. We called him Sparkly Lobo because he was... <laughs> He was sort of fancy, and I inherited that character. He had been created by someone else, so I didn't create Sparkly Lobo. But DC, when I took the Lobo book, they were determined that that was the Lobo I was going to write, because my original pitch was that Lobo and the main man. They were brothers. It been up. so cool. They were teaming up in this, like, space hot rod and going through space and, you know, doing bounties together, and they had very different styles and very different attitudes. And I really wanted to do that book, but DC, they were not hearing it. They are like, no. No, you're doing this Lobo and he has to kill main man Lobo in the first not even in the first issue they wanted him dead like within the first couple of pages that's how it starts out three pages in if I remember correctly the second page he's dead second page? Okay. <laughs> yeah. because after they told me I had to have that I was like okay so what if sparkly Lobo is hunting main man Lobo for four, the first four issues They're like nope we want him dead issue one as quickly as possible I was like alright second page he's dead I got a lot of heat for that but that's alright I was managing a comic book store at the time when that book came out and one of my friends is a diehard Lobo fan and he was helping me Tuesday he was helping me with the poll list we're done he's sitting there reading it I'm finishing my orders making sure everything's alright book comes flying by my head I was like you just opened that what's going on look I love 90s Lobo what's not to love but I was doing my job and I came to love Sparkly Lobo but yeah a lot of people hated it he did come into his own it was he a good character it was a good run but I remember being at a convention right after I started that book the book had just come out I went to the restroom or something and I was walking back to my table and this other creator says, hey man, Lobo's looking for you. And I was like, what? He said, Lobo is looking for you and he's mad. And I was like, alright. So I walk back to my table I sit at my table. I look down the way and here, coming down the hallway, this dude dressed as 90s Lobo. He had the chains, he was in the leather. And he came walking up and I saw he had a comic book rolled up tight and stuck in his back pocket. <laughs> Just stomping down. He had these ginormous boots. And he came up he pulled the comic out. It was Lobo number he said, did you write this? I got some things to say to you. At first, he seemed kind of mad, but we talked. And I was like, look, I can't help it. This is what I was hired to do. I get where you come from. I mean, I like that guy. We had a good conversation after that. <laughs> he was so angry about Sparkly Lobo. And I get it. It's fine. I mean, I still would write Sparkly Lobo, though. I actually thought the character was going somewhere and was doing something cool. And then I really liked it when I connected it to the Sinestro storyline. I, I was having a good time with it. So tying into all that, I guess the question is, what is the most difficult difficult part about taking over a series that has already been successful with a successful creative team. The one that sticks out to me the most is Venom. I was such a fan of Agent Venom out the gate, and I remember being so content after that first issue I read of yours. And that was, I think, one of the first things I read of yours at all, to be honest, but like Moon Knight, Uncanny X-Men. What's the challenge of taking over? It depends on if you're taking over a run that is kind of looked up to. Rick Remender's run on Venom, they loved it. Or if you're taking over a book that people just hate. Usually it's me that writes the run they can't stand. I'm just setting up the next person for success. The challenge is if a publisher hires me to do that story, they're hiring me to write it in my way. I can't write what Reminder was writing. I couldn't do the story that he was telling. I had to figure out how to put a stamp on it that's my own stamp and make it my own story, but honor the stuff that's come before. And that's sort of the balancing act that you have to do with any of those things. And a lot of times, those books are kind of destined for failure. There's very little that any creator can do if they're inheriting a book everyone loved, you know, that the creative team was the team that everyone loved. It can be tough for any creator to live up to that. Maybe they've changed. Like I said, I haven't worked for Marvel or DC in a while, but there were so many times where, okay, this book ran for 11 issues, we're going to cancel it and restart it. And they do that because a number one sells better than a number 12 yeah. and they won't hire me to write it even if my run was well regarded they wouldn't hire me to write it and the reason is a different writer they think they can sell a different writer as the new hotness more than they could sell a writer continuing and that's a very frustrating attitude for me yeah. I hate that opinion that you've written this character so you shouldn't write them again you were at the time at Marvel where they started implementing that because like you took over Venom Venom didn't start over at a new number one when you took over Moon Knight it didn't start over a new number one and then probably about six months to a year later is when they started 
every new creative team is a new number one, which was at the time I was a retailer beyond annoying. Yeah. I can only imagine as a creator how annoying that was. It would have been less frustrating if that attitude of a different writer is going to sell more wasn't there. You got to keep in mind, I come from the era, you know, when I was reading Marvel Comics, it was these great, massive, epic runs. Very few creators really get the chance to do that anymore. A few do, but not many. Most of the time, those editors will quickly tell you a 12 issue run is considered a huge success. That's the nature of the business right now. I don't have to like it. Do you ever see us going back to those long runs again without new number ones constantly? Or do you feel that this is what the industry has now established and this will be the norm going forward? I think it's going to be the norm, if not forever, for a long while. You'll have a few of those big long runs, but I think those reboots, they're going to be continuing, especially in those especially in the bigger companies. In independence, it's the same way. There are going to be very few independent comics that can really last for long run. I did a 50-issue run on the Six Gun and a 32-issue run on Harrow County. One of the greatest comics I've ever read, by the way. Harrow County I, is in my Mount Rushmore of independent books, for well, sure. I appreciate that. But I don't know that I'll ever be in a situation where I'm writing one of those giant runs again. I just don't know if there's a market for them anymore. I mean, a few people are able to do it, but there's such a crazy attrition in comics. You said you worked at a comic shop. I mean, I'm sure you saw it. So issue number two is already ordered before issue one comes out. Yep. And you cut it by 30% because you don't know well, if it's going to sell. Yeah. It's yeah. going to sell half. So numbers drop instantly between one and two. Even if number one comes out and people say it's the greatest comic that's ever been written, it still lost half its numbers between number one and two. For and, sure. you know, that'll kill a lot of comics. Hero County, I was really lucky. I hate the word spec. I'm not that guy. <laughs> but I ordered heavy on Hero County because I love the artwork and I like horror comics and I got really lucky. Uh, Harrow County did very well for my store when I was there, especially in trade. I mean, single issue was gone usually yeah. on Wednesday, but probably 60, 70 copies of the first trade was out the door yeah. when the first came to trade. I mean, and the book still does well in trade and, and that's great. I don't mind people specking on books though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, I know. It doesn't bother me. Spec away. Switch gears slightly. You recently came to TikTok and one of your TikToks is a beautiful tour of your office and it's very apparent, not only with the books that you've written, but with your office that you are a big horror fan. Yes. So I'm curious if you can give us three horror books or three horror movies that everyone should read. Just three? Just um, three of each. I'm limiting you. All right. So I'm not even going to say these are my favorites. Most people that are listening to this have already seen these movies. But I would say The Thing, Alien, those are the two everybody's seen, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'd throw Session 9 into the mix, which is one a lot of people haven't seen. That's a newer one, right? Newer one compared to the other two. Yes, compared to the okay. other two. <laughs> it's newer, but it's a great one. It has a great setup. It's about a group of asbestos cleaners that are hired to go clean out an old asylum. And I mean, that's a great setup in and of itself, but super creepy. I'm not saying it's one of my favorites, but I would definitely recommend it. Books. Three books. They could be uh, comics or a real book. We could say comics. I would say the Alan Moore Saga of the Swamp thing. That's a great, oh my great God. book people should read. I would say on the non-comic side, I would suggest Thomas Ligotti's The Nightmare Factory, which is a giant thick book of great short stories just so good and i would recommend another short story collection again i'm trying to get some variety here i would probably recommend stephen king's skeleton crew i think that's the one with the mist in it i get the two old collections mixed up but stephen king's the skeleton crew is another one i'd recommend because then you get a nice variety of horror stories thank you for those recommendations i've read and watched all of them but i was really awesome. curious to pick your brain really quick so now let's talk about your horror books shock shop yes I really enjoyed it, and I will say, I will be honest, I am not the number one horror fan. It is not at the top of my genre list. Yeah. Yet I still enjoyed Shock Shop quite a bit, and I'm very intrigued by both stories. The first one more so, but I just wanted to start with that. If you could just give a quick synopsis of Something in the Woods in the Dark for our listeners. Yeah, so Shock Shop contains two stories. Something in the Woods in the Dark is about a married couple that has been going through a very difficult time. And along with a bunch of friends, they decide to go on a camping trip to kind of heal these wounds between them. But when they get out into the woods, there is something 
something out there stalking them. This terrible creature is stalking them. That's how it starts out in the first issue of Shock Shop. Things take a really weird turn in the next issue of Shock Shop. But the initial setup is group of friends on a camping trip, married couple having a lot of trouble, and there's a monster out there trying to kill them. That seems to be sort of a shapeshifter. Yeah, definitely a shapeshifter. We won't give that away of what it shifted from. Right. I definitely was first intrigued by the marital issues. I was very curious of who did what and who I should be taking sides with. That was my <laughs> initial reaction. That's actually one of the things I wanted to do with that story is who do you take sides with? Because both of them are kind of at fault in what's going on. But I think readers will always gravitate to one or the other and not always the same one. I didn't want to put a clear delineation that one is the hero in that failed relationship and one is the villain. I've decided to take sides with the shape-shifting monster. That's right. <laughs> 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 and then the second story, The Familiars. Again, if you could give a synopsis on that for our listeners. Yeah, so Familiars is the story of a man who has gone through a relatively recent divorce and is striking out on his own. He leases a house, and when he gets into the house, he notices that there is some sort of spirit that's helping him. Like, he loads all his boxes, and he falls asleep, and the next day all his boxes are unpacked. And there's something in the house helping him out, doing pleasant things to make his life easier. Easier. And then we see what that is at the end of the first issue of Familiars. And it may not be as benevolent as it seems when you when this guy's happy that his house is getting unpacked and his dishes are getting cleaned by some sort of weird force. There may be something more to it. You know, it's interesting. I, I didn't set out to do this with those two stories. I didn't consciously say to myself I was going to explore different sides of failed relationships. But that's what I did with those two stories. They both kind of have similar themes that we kind of dig into in very different ways. Yeah, I say don't judge a book by its cover. Just because they look like demons, they're still helping out. You're going to find out next issue. You know, Shock Shop's fun for me because it's a flip book. I don't know if you guys read it digitally or in a hard copy, but you read the book and you flip it over and you read the book again, you have two different stories. And over the first, or over four issues, those two stories will be serialized. And then if and when we do another Shock Shop, fingers crossed, hopefully we will, we're going to do a two different stories that will be serialized over the course of the next four issues. The book as a whole, too, was very fun. I enjoyed it. The main character of the father. Just the aspect of single dad of like, yeah, no, no, it's fine. We're good. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Everybody can support a single dad. So, if you couldn't tell by my attire, I am a big Shadow Man fan. I think I'm currently on the shelves you have Book of Shadows. And although Valiant's publishing is taking a step back, I think Book of Shadows will be completed by the end of the year, maybe? One book a month? Your run on Shadow Man was super delayed. I know that it was put in right at the beginning of the pandemic because I had connections and I got a hold of it. How long ago was Book of Shadows plotted? Was that plotted a long time ago as well or was that more recent? I'm just curious for edification. Book of Shadows is a more recent project. So my original run on Shadow Man was supposed to be 12 issues. I was going to do a 12 issue run on Shadow Man that would tell the story of the dead side and everything. So it was going to be a little less compressed than it was. And then sometime after the fifth issue I think was done, I got a call and they said, hey, we're only going to do eight issues on Shadow Man. It definitely felt rushed at the end there. Yeah, yeah. and the other thing is, the whole Dead Side War was supposed to be its own series. It was going to be its own mini-series that was going to feature all of the Valiant universe in a bigger way. And then that got scrapped for some reason. It was disappointing because we had a cool story in mind. When I first started on Shadow Man and Dennis Hopeless was doing Exo Manowar, he and I had this idea of an Exo Manowar Shadow Man crossover that was going to be a big event too, that was going to be the supernatural side of the Valiant universe versus the technological side of the Valiant universe in a big way. So it was a little disappointing because I had bigger plans for Shadow Man. I wanted it to be a little less compressed. And then I had to finish what was supposed to be its own independent four-issue arc. I had to finish in what became two and a half issues worth of story, which just rushed it. But they were happy with Shadow Man, so they wanted me to do a new series called Book of Shadows. So that's when that took shape. It's a much more recent development. And, you know, my, my original plan was was I always wanted to have one of these supernatural books in the pipe at all times. I wanted to do more Punk Mambo. I wanted to do, you know, more Shadow Man. And now I don't even know. Book of Shadows is done. Well, I think some of the art for the last issue may still be incomplete, but not by much. I mean, the book's done. With schedule. the publishing schedule, because they're releasing one book a month, I think the second issue of Book of Shadows is out this month, and then I think the third's not coming out until December, maybe? That sounds right. I know it's very 
very delayed. As a creator, are you worried about the state of Valiant at all? I mean, you've worked with them for a while now. Are you worried about where the company's headed? It's difficult not to worry about it when, you know, all these changes are taking place and books are getting weirdly delayed for months and months. Yeah, it's a little troubling. I hope it all gets figured out and resolved in a way that we can continue doing books and there can be some new stuff that I can work on in that, you know, on the supernatural side. I'm not holding my breath for doing any more books after Book of Shadows because I just don't know. Nothing would surprise me if tomorrow they announced, hey, Valiant is getting sold to another publisher or Valiant is just not going to publish anymore. I don't think I could be surprised. I'm kind of waiting for all of it. I'm just kind of expecting what could happen. If um, you had the opportunity to work on another Valiant character, I mean, we got Book of Shadows. Who else would you like to take a stab at? Being a big Valiant fan, if you want to stay in the Supernatural side, I'm curious who you'd want to. If you want to expand to another part of the universe, I'm curious who you would choose if you had to choose one. You know, there was a fleeting moment where I was going to take over Exo Man of War. I was kind of excited about that. I had a 12 issue pitch for what my Exo Man of War story was going to be. And then that just didn't happen. I'm not sure I would have said Exo though, if I had to pick one other one. And it's not Ninja. Maybe Rai? Rai's oh, not- I would love to see you do Rai. Rai is the one that I think I could do something cool with. That's what I have to balance. Which character do I think I could contribute something with and I could do something really interesting? Rai, I think, has potential. Obviously, Rai is very futuristic, very yeah. sci-fi. I could just picture you putting in a, a tweak of Supernatural, a tweak of horror, and yeah. that would be a fun run. I think Rai could have a cool sort of dark cyberpunk feel that I would like. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Do you feel good about all of your Shadow Man Valiant questions? Yeah, my fanboying's done. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> matching I don't know if necklace. you've noticed a mask over here. Oh. Yeah. That's actually pages from the Valiant up top there. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, that's what's interesting. Valiant fans are so dedicated. Insane. You can say yeah, they, No, I was going to say insane. <laughs> They're just dedicated. And I like that. That was one of the things I liked most about working on Valiant books was I felt like I was contributing to a universe that was still relatively in its infancy. I mean, it's still pretty new. 30 years, but yeah. <laughs> but I'm talking about the new iteration. Yeah, that, yeah, know, true. Yeah. currently going on? Look, I was working in a comic shop when that first those first Valiant books were coming out. I remember them. I'm glad I wasn't. I was still baby. And I mean, <laughs> I love Valiant, but I can clearly see they contributed to the downfall of comics in 1994. Like, I can was, clearly see that. It was a weird time in comics. But I felt like the fans were there with you on that ride. And they were in it for you to do different things and try cool things and, you know, fairly open minds. When, when we were talking with Dennis, he said a very similar thing. Valiant fans were very dedicated. And the problem, the biggest problem is getting new ones. Because you've got us fans from way back when who continued over. And then you've got random people who've picked it up. But the turnover, it's probably like 70% old school to 30% new school. Yeah, and that's really the challenge that all of comics really has. How do you get people to take a chance on something when there's so many books out there? And Valiant, getting new readers, I feel like the challenge Valiant has is is what you just described, that 30-year history. They look back and they oh, 30 years. I mean, if I'm going to get that engaged in a long 30-year history, I might as well try to read, you know, X-Men or something like that. Yeah. So it's hard to woo them into those books. And also releasing one book a month is not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think a little more would be better. Yeah, agreed. We got the chance to read your new book a little bit early. Can you describe Door to Door, Night by Night to our listeners? Absolutely. So Door to Door, Night by Night is a new book from Vault. It's coming out November 17th. It's set in the 80s. It's the story of a door to door sales team. And it's kind of based, my dad was a door to door salesman. He ran a sales crew and he had a very unique opinion of what made a great sales team. He thought that the very best sales salespeople were rejects, drunks, and burnouts. And he thought that because they would work all day, they'd sell all day long, they'd make a bunch of money, and the very next day they'd be dead broke because they spent all their money on booze, you know, the night after their work. So they'd come back the next day and they got to work again and make money. And my dad hired those kind of folks. He would pick up hitchhikers along the road and hire them on the spot. You know, he'd see a hitchhiker, he'd say, hey, I'll give you a ride. Do you need a job? We're on a sales trip. That was how he made his living. Those were the folks he hired, and I traveled a lot with them. I did door-to-door sales with them for a while. So I took those memories and put them into this book. So Door-to-Door Night by Night is a group of sort of 'er ne'er-do-well drunks and burnouts and just not people that you really would want representing you in a lot of ways. They go to these different towns, but in every town they encounter some other supernatural horror that they have to contend with. So they become sort of these monster hunters 
leaders that are moving from town to town, but they have no business defending mankind from the forces of darkness, but they're kind of thrust into that role. So about halfway through the book, the book really turns on its head. There's a great establishment of what the hell's going on, and then it gets crazy. Not to spoil anything. We're going crazy rest of the way, or are we getting more bits and pieces along the way? And what is the scheduled run right now? There are 12 issues initially, and, you know, it's all dependent on sales reception and, and, and sales and what people are thinking of it. Maybe beyond that. 12 issues initially, though. I'm working on issue five right now. The way I've set this book up, there's a lot more surprises. I'm going to really be digging into the backgrounds of all of the characters, because even though they're kind of no good folks, I kind of want readers to like them. So I really start digging into the backgrounds, how they became who they are. You know, one of the ideas is that they're encountering monsters wherever they go, but you kind of bring your own monsters with you wherever you go. And each of these folks have monsters that they're contending with. I deal with that a lot in every issue, but one of the things I don't want to do, you're not going to see any vampires or werewolves in this book. All of the creatures that they are dealing with are going to be completely weird, out of left field, <laughs> monsters you're not expecting, because I wanted to do something just a little bit different when it came to monster hunting. So you're not going to see like sort of the trope monsters. At least my initial 12 issue plan, you don't see any of that. But yeah, there are definitely big surprises along the way. And it's a humor book. There's humor to it, but the horror is real and the threats that they're facing, you know, they have stakes for these characters. Sweet. Yeah, I just want to say that the characters are very distinctive with their different personalities and I think makes for a great story. And you're not joking with the creature they come across. It is unique. <laughs> yeah, Sally Cantorino, who drew it, she really just went to town on that creature when it shows up. You're like, oh my. You know, so she mm -hmm. didn't hold back on her design when it came to that monster. One of my favorite things about the book, we read it digitally, but the only thing that breaks into the gutters is the monster. Like, yes. the gutters are very well established, and the only thing that breaks is the monster. So it adds scale to it. Yeah. And when you sent it to us, the logo in the upper left-hand corner was Nightfall. Is that an imprint within Vault, or is that just yeah. Vault itself? So Vault has an imprint line called Nightfall. That's where they do all of their dark fantasy and horror books. Okay. So the book I did previously with them was called The Last Book You'll Ever Read. That was one of the Nightfall line. And I'm pretty sure, like, the Autumnal was Nightfall. But yeah, any of their horror books are going to be under that Nightfall branding. Awesome. Thank you. I was curious about that. So I really enjoyed the book. I'm a little mad that we read it now because by the time we actually get it on shelves and we have to wait for number two. There's the downfall of reading advanced copies as you have yeah. a little longer to wait. But I did really enjoy it. And with that, we did want to ask you any other upcoming projects that might not even have advanced reviews yet. Anything that's out, just everything, Cullen Bun. <laughs> so yeah, I've got a ton of books that are in progress right now, but haven't been announced. I'm doing one that has been announced. I'm doing a book for Mad Cave called A Legacy of Violence. The first issue of that drops the same day as Door to Door Night by Night. It's solicited now. You can order that. Continuing with Shock Shop, I'm doing some work with different publishers. I'm doing a book with Source Point that I can't tell you about just yet, but I know they're going to preview editions at New York Comic Con. I've posted some hints about that on TikTok, too, about that upcoming book. So I've got that book. I'm looking over this way because I've got my bulletin board of all the projects I'm working on. You could just show us real quick. That'd be cool. <laughs> I can't. There's too many secrets. Too many secrets. Also, uh, that I, bulletin board's probably six feet tall based on the amount of work you put out. Yeah. <laughs> it isn't, but it's pretty hefty. I'm doing a new book with Brian Hurt, the artist I worked with on The Damned and The Six Gun. I'm doing a new book with him for Dark Horse. I mean, it's still several months down the line. But yeah, and I'm doing a couple of new books for AWA right now that haven't been announced, but will be announced pretty soon. That was the other company I couldn't think of at the top of the hour. I know you've done something with it. Yeah, yeah so. I've done a little bit, but I've got a couple more books with them on the horizon as well. And yeah, I mean, like I said, I have other artists that I've been talking to in the last week or two, and I'm busily pitching new projects to publishers all the time. That's one of the things you have to do that I have to do as a freelancer. I have to do the books that I have contracted to do, but I also have to keep the wheels turning for new work as well. Oh, I've got a one shot from Archie that's coming out in October called called The Chilling Adventures of Salem. There we go. It's just the cat Salem going off on an adventure in the dead that's of cool. night. And I've got another book coming out from Aftershock that's a one shot. I don't know if you're familiar. They do these books called one shocks that are like a little oversized. They're like album sized and they're like 40 something pages. I've done a couple with them and I've got a new one called A Foulness in the Walls that is coming out November or October. It's in the current previews. I know that. Like the old Marvel graphic novels. Yeah, they're they're about that size. You were yeah. showing some of yours off on 
TikTok, and yeah. you don't have Emperor Doom, which you should. No, you're right. And it's interesting because I really did. I just stumbled onto him, and I was like, I'm always trying to figure out something to collect. You know, I'm collecting Uncanny X-Men because it's a book I collected with my dad when I was a kid, and I sold all the issues. So I'm collecting that, but that's almost done. So now I'm like, what can I collect that's not super expensive, but also super fun for me? And those old Marvel graphic novels. There's uh, only 27 them. of them, and some of them are hard to find, and 99% of them are great reads. So they're there, just there, fun. There's only 27 of those? There's only 27. Emperor wow. Doom was the last one, and then yeah. they went down to like the standard size. So the first one is yeah. Death of the Captain Marvel. The last one yeah. is Emperor Doom. Yeah. I'm going to go for those, but not just the Marvel ones. DC did a ton <laughs> of ones too, and then there's a bunch of independent ones that I remember from when I was a kid. I have some, but I want to go for those. Just that format. There's something about that format I really, really like. Where can everyone follow you to see all these updates on these new projects and whatnot? So I have a website, CullenBun.com. I have a TikTok that's Cullen Bun. I have a Twitter that's Cullen Bun. And I'll tell you, I have a Patreon that's Cullen Bun. So Cullen Bun on all the social medias <laughs> and different platforms. From my website or Twitter, you can get to my newsletter. And I put out a newsletter every Sunday that I load with hints of things to come. Like I just posted a bunch of variant covers that I haven't released yet. I post a lot of hints of things to come. I post a lot of just thoughts on my life and on writing. Sometimes I probably say more than I should about the publishing industry. And I keep a running list of everything that's coming up, all vaguely disguised, but there's a list there that says I'm doing a book about spies coming up from a publisher I haven't worked with before, and I keep a list of all the things that I'm kind of getting up to on that newsletter as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate her talking to you. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me. Everything you've been doing is fantastic. I'm looking forward to all the releases. I obviously am going to bother you on TikTok again to come on again because there's so much more to talk about just in a anytime. few months. Anytime. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of new books announced I would say in the next couple of months. So for sure. Thanks again. Appreciate it. It's really great time talking to you. Thank you guys. Panelist podcast. Panelist podcast. That would have been fun in like 15 minutes from now. That would have been terrible. <laughs>